Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I am O'Brien McMahon, and this is People Business. In this episode, I'm joined by Misha Ann Martin. Misha Ann Martin is the Senior Director of People Analytics and Research at Work Human. She has a PhD in industrial organizational psychology and has spent almost 20 years as a researcher and practitioner. Dr. Martin is considered a people analytics and employee experience expert as she has led these efforts in companies like Flex, JetBlue, and Raymond James Financial. In her current role with WorkHuman, Dr. Martin provides analytics consulting focused on proving the impact of positive work experiences for individuals and organizations. She regularly speaks on topics from recognition to wellness to inclusion, psychological safety, and and a whole host of others in publications from Forbes to Fortune to Bloomberg, and again, many more. In this conversation, we go deep into employee recognition. That is one of the key products and services that WorkHuman provides. The reason I wanted to bring her on is because I had the opportunity to sit in on a work human roundtable with a number of HR leaders. I went in pretty skeptical. I was not a big fan of recognition programs. I had a lot of biases in my own mind on what they were and where they did and did not work and mostly where they didn't work. And I have to say that that conversation really changed my mind and changed my perspective on what recognition was in the workplace And so I wanted to dive into this conversation with Misha Ann, and she definitely delivered a great conversation to help business leaders from HR to any other form of business leader think through the role that recognition can play in the workforce. It's great to have a formal program, as she'll talk about from a tracking standpoint. But as you'll hear, I think just thinking about adding more recognition to our lives in general is a net positive. I hope you enjoy this conversation. I hope it's helpful to you and your lives and your workplace. Here is Misha Ann Martin. Misha Ann, welcome to the show. Very excited to have you on today. I was sitting next to some of your colleagues in an event talking about employee recognition programs. And I will admit that I went into that event excited to meet the people there, but not that thrilled about the content because I had some judgments on employee recognition what those programs were, and some of them pleasantly were dispelled during that conversation. And so I had gone up to the organizers afterwards and said, hey, I'd love to bring on somebody from WorkHuman to talk about employee recognition. And they said, well, we have just the person for you. And and that was you. So here we are. And uh, I'm excited to to dive into this topic. I was wondering if you could just kind of start out at the beginning. What is WorkHuman? We'll just start with what is WorkHuman, and then we'll get into employee recognition. Awesome. So first of all, I love that story. Confession is good for the soul. Thank you for letting me know that you are new to being okay with this idea of of recognition. But what is work human as a company? So the inadequate but simple explanation is that we're an HR technology company. That does not at all do us justice. We do have a suite of products. However, one of the biggest ones is recognition, but we have other things like conversations. That is all about continuous performance management. And then another suite of products we call celebrations that allow people to celebrate service milestones and life events. Also, community gatherings and things that people do together, volunteering as a group, for example. Now, the real explanation of who we are is this. We are a purpose-driven organization that exists to make work more human, and we use our technology as a lever for that. So. Through our technology, we're emphasizing things like social connection and appreciation and inclusion and belonging. And we're working to show that making work more human benefits the individual and the company and, dare I say, the entire world. So let me ask this, I don't know, maybe controversial question. Why is a company like Work Human needed in the first place, in your opinion? You know, there are several reasons. People often ask me, why can't I just say, thank you in the moment? Doesn't that count? The answer to that is it does count. However, as you get larger and more distributed, you start to only have that experience with people who are near you. We know that the way that work is evolving 
fewer and fewer people are in your proximity in that natural way anymore. And so technology is a real enabler of those experiences, particularly when people are not always in front of each other. The other thing that technology allows you to do is have documentation of that experience. That allows you to measure it. That allows you to see as an organization who's getting left out. Are there biases in language? Are we describing people's accomplishments differently? And so even though it does count (laughs) when you do it one-on-one and in person, a company like WorkHuman allows you the technology to really make it widespread across your business It allows you to measure what's happening with it. And then lastly, but certain of all, not least, a company like WorkHuman, and I dare say we're the only one like this, we do a lot of research on this idea of recognition. And so what you're also getting from a company, from WorkHuman specifically, is not that just the technology, but the expertise to make sure that you're fully leveraging recognition to have the impact that you want. And so what is an employee recognition program? This would be a good spot to just define it. How do you define it? Yeah, so an employee recognition program is a program that facilitates people saying thank you to each other for who they are, what they do for each other. And then if you want to make it even better for things that people experience in their lives, like you know, having a baby or buying a new home or or getting a new puppy. So it standardizes that in a way that helps it to get integrated in your culture because technology is an enabler of doing that easily and for the most people. So just in practical terms, the way it works is I would recognize you for something. I would type up a note. I send it to you. I can choose to attach a monetary component to it or not, which is points. When I get it, I can redeem the points if there are points associated with the message for something in the catalog. And if I choose and you choose, that message can end up on a social feed for anybody else in the organization to see and to comment on, which amplifies the experience of recognition. So one of my initial rubs of this is why is this needed in the first place? Mm -hmm. This is a lot of this seems like basic human interaction. I get maybe, you know, now we're in a virtual world. And so we need to be a little bit more specific in how we do this a little bit more intentional. But these programs have been around long before we were in a fully virtual world. So why, why are we so bad at this? (laughs) You know, I'm coming across this old idea that it's just your job and just do it. And that's such an antiquated way of thinking about human behavior and performance. You can think about this more broadly as targeted, and I love the word that you used, intentional feedback. So if I'm a leader, if I'm your organization, whatever I want you to know is important that I want you to repeat. I should positively reinforce. And what I should do is I should do that in a way so that not only you know that I and the organization values this behavior, but other people can see and receive that same message as well. So I think, you know, people know that saying thank you is important, but they don't understand the power of doing that well and doing that intentionally. And that's why we're here. What is the power of saying thank you? You just said leaders don't understand the power of saying thank you. What is the power? You know, I would say it's kind of twofold, right? So number one is the impact on the person. I feel like you've seen me and you've seen what I do. If it's done well, you know, you've referred to my very special sauce and said that this special sauce is important to the organization and this is the impact. It has to people around you. So it connects people. It's, it's engaging. It's a performance enhancer because it creates this aspirational, this energy, right, that I now want to dedicate towards the organization and what the organization wants me to do. But then there's this other avenue of the impact that's more about culture creation and business impact. 
if I have aspirational values for my organization, this is a way for me to intentionally create that culture that we're aspiring to by positively reinforcing the behaviors associated with each of those values. If I want to drive towards a safety culture, this is my opportunity to reinforce things like mindfulness and calling things out, right? So this is my opportunity to drive people towards a particular culture where certain values are lived out every day in real life and to drive real business outcomes like safety and productivity, performance, customer satisfaction, patient satisfaction. It reminds me, I know we said this in our prep call for this, but it reminds me of how to win friends and influence people. Right. That old book of the things that you acknowledge are the things that you reinforce. And if you want to see more of something, start complimenting people when they do it. Is it really just that simple? It really is kind of that simple. I think the, you know, I don't want to say this is hard, but transparently, I think where people struggle is getting beyond the simple thank you for doing X to a more detailed explanation of the behavior and the impact and how that behavior actually made you feel. We're not used to talking about feelings at work. But as a psychologist, I know that vulnerability connects people. You know, it cements human relationships and makes things stick. And so if I said to you, hey, thank you for doing that particular thing. Here's what it meant to me. And here's how it felt. I felt supported. I felt like I had a person in the room that helped me deliver this message and I no longer felt alone. That's different and more impactful than just saying, hey, thank you for being there for me. And so this thing is a, is a muscle that people can build up and get better over time. But just like any journey, it starts with a few steps. That makes sense to me because I've had behaviors in the past where I said, you know, I want to be the kind of person who does X. Like a, a good example was, I would see people around me who would just naturally connect to other people and they just, they would just think about, oh yeah, you need to meet so-and-so. And I just always wanted to be one of those people and I was not. And so I wound up writing lists of like everybody I knew. And then when I would meet somebody new, I would sit there and I would go through the whole list of everybody else that I knew because I needed to see the visual cue to say, oh yeah, that's right. They should meet these people. And it was like a no duh when I saw the person's name, but without it, I, you know, I, I would never have come across it or never have thought about it. And then I still use those lists today. It's a good tool for me, but I find that I am better at it in real time right. now because I put a lot of those reps in. So I could see this being something similar where I have to force myself in the beginning to give gratitude, as silly as that sounds, to have to force yourself to do, but it is a new behavior. So I have to force myself to show gratitude and to practice it in the way that I want to be the type of person I want to be in the future. And then that gets easier over time. That's absolutely right. And I give people two tips to get started. One is a calendar appointment on either a Monday or a Friday, where you just, as you go through the week, you take notes of people who have made a difference for you. And then you take your own gratitude time, right? And you... Send recognition to everybody that you have in this calendar appointment. If you have time left, go to the social feed and amplify somebody else's recognition moment and say, hey, you know what? That behavior meant something to me too. I witnessed that. The other practical tip I give people, and I realized that before I built my gratitude muscle, I was really bad at this. I would speak well of somebody I knew and I would never tell the person I was talking about that that's how I felt about them. Mm. So now, whenever that happens, I'm like, oh, let me make sure I tell that person, even if it's just a random text, you know, or a phone call or an email. And it's, I got to tell you, it's a difference maker. So this brings me to one of my other hesitations with this, which is that if we put a recognition program in place and we air quote, force leaders or managers to give out recognition that it's going to be contrived and it's not going to be well received, right? That it's just, 
hey, we're trying to check some box and show we've got this great culture. And so we're going to put this thing out there. And, you know, I just see that going poorly and having the opposite reaction. What do you say to that naysayer? Yeah, I think in some ways you're absolutely right. In our research with Gallup, we find that inauthenticity is the death knell of a recognition program. It's not enough to just have a recognition program. You have to be intentional about the decisions you make around that in order for it to go well. And one of those decisions is about how to make sure that people are always authentic. So I know there are some companies out there that do this whole gamification things and badges and work human doesn't do that because that does not make for an authentic experience and an authentic message. So we really emphasize the message that people send. We, (laughs) you write a note. Most of our clients, I would probably say all of our clients, the recognition program is organized around the company's values. And then for each value, there is some language around what kinds of behaviors are you recognizing around each of these values? And so, you know, we really give people prompts and tips of things to look for and things to recognize to help them write a specific message, which has the increased probability of coming across as authentic, as opposed to something that's like, oh, I just need a badge, or I'm trying to win on this leaderboard, you know? So you have to design it for what you want instead of just more thank yous. Yeah. And it it seems like it'd almost be better to get somebody just saying, hey, thanks for your help this week. And just leaving it at that, if it's authentic, then to be profusive in your praise and have it come off even a little bit trite. Yes, you don't want it to come across as trite, but you do want to be specific. You know, like, thank you for your help this week is a little bit of a throwaway, right? Yeah. Um, What did that help mean to you? What did it prevent? How did it impact other team members? What was the specific help? Because, you know, you can reinforce the wrong things. If you reinforce people working nights, weekends, canceling vacations for customers, this is going to lead to a toxic culture that is full of people that are stressed and burned out. That is why it is so important to work with an expert on this. Like have somebody who's going to help you actually look at that data and go, is this driving towards your intended culture or are you having unintended consequences because you're recognizing the wrong thing? So that's a good point. Let's, let's stay there for a second because I work in air quotes again, high performance business. We, we want to be high performing, right? We were a service business. We want to be there for our clients. We're at the beck and call of our clients sometimes and their deadlines And so there are times where somebody will be on vacation, but there's a deadline for something we're trying to get across the finish line and, you know, they'll step in and do something. I want to say thank you, right? Mm -hmm. We, We want to be very gracious in that moment and acknowledge what that person has done. And yet we don't necessarily want to reinforce the behavior that everybody has to, or or the expectation, I'll say, that everybody has to do that all the time. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance that line? Do you just like not give recognition when somebody does something like that? Or like, what's the best practice there? No, you absolutely should recognize it because the person went out of their way. But in the message, you want to say that, hey, you know, this is not something that we intend for you to do all the time. We're really grateful that you did it this time. That's number one. Number two, this is really important. You don't want that to be the only thing you're recognizing for. You also want to recognize and reinforce people who prevented that or Mm. people who, you know, you might want to not want to do this formally in a recognition program, but in the way you talk to each other, you might want to say, hey, for this vacation, like maybe you really want to disconnect. You've earned it. So you want to reinforce what you really want to see more of while acknowledging when somebody went out of the way to do something that maybe had to happen, but you want less of. Yeah. 
it's interesting because it's such a gray area, that kind of scenario where as a leader, you have to make sure that your team is doing the work ahead of time right. so that you don't have to tap into personal time. But then if you do tap into personal time, you have to reinforce the fact that that's not the standard and not the expectations, right. but show the gratitude. And so there's there's a lot of different things that you have to be aware of to really be a good, thoughtful leader for your team and to be protecting your team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just shows the complexity of being a leader. Yeah, but also to the point of, you know, recognition data as a an important source of information. You know, you're in one area of the business and you may know how much that is happening in your area. Well, think about across the business. This allows you to see if it's happening more across the business than you want, right? And mm -hmm. so that allows you to adjust because everybody sees their little piece. But if everybody around the business is doing this acknowledgement when this happens, then that really allows you to, to see the extent to which it's happening, which is also super important. Yeah. So what does the data look like? Like what kind of data does somebody get from a program like this and what can they do with it? Yeah. So you want to be looking at frequency, like how often are people getting recognized in general? Individuals, like how often is each individual getting recognized? Yes. As a leader, an individual leader, you should be looking at that and you should have technology that helps you see that. Across the business, you want to know the average experience, right? Like how often is each person getting touched by recognition throughout the year? You want to look at segmentation. Are people more likely to get recognized than others based on different demographics or departments or tenures, things like that? Then you want to look at the compensation received from a recognition program. You want to look at that the same way that we have a discipline of looking at pay equity. Another thing I recommend people look at is the language used in a recognition program. What we're finding in our research is that people can have the same role, but have their accomplishments described differently based on demographics. So for example, you know, for men, we tend to see recognition around the outcomes and the tasks and expertise. And for women, we tend to see recognition around the process and the how and our personalities and our attitudes. And that has implications for the amount of points that are associated with a recognition event. So allowing you to see these things, again, allows you to adjust and refine because you can't fix what you're not aware of. And then the last thing that I recommend is also understanding whether or not recognition is contributing to your business. So how does it link to and drive things like engagement, performance, safety, you know, any outcome that you care about? Because once you can show that, then you can start to show the business how this can be used as a lever to accomplish different things instead of just, you know, how we get stuck in the HR space. It's nice to have. And so when the business gets in trouble, <laughs> the nice to haves get cut. It's really important for the business to understand how something like this is not just a feel good, even though that's important, but also a lever to improve business outcomes as well. Do you have examples of clients that have improved business outcomes and how they measured and demonstrated that? Sure. So we have a lot of clients using engagement surveys, and that is one of the ways that people usually find us and come to us. They go, well, the recognition item on our engagement survey is really low and we want to improve that. That's typically how people come to us. And so that's a pretty typical, I would say, level one outcome measure. The engagement on that same engagement score is another outcome measure. A lot of clients are using it to reduce turnover. We see that as another outcome measure. So turnover decreases post-implementation. Scores on that retention item and on the engagement index in general go up. And then we have other clients who have used it to improve plant safety and plant performance or improve customer satisfaction or patient satisfaction. So as an example, I used to be at a client several years ago. It was an airline 
And we knew that when a pilot got out of the cockpit to make an announcement or customer service scores would be higher. And so we knew that when we were traveling the network, if we ever saw a pilot do that, we would take out our phones and recognize that behavior immediately. So that's a practical way of how this can be applied to drive an outcome. And then you can see the relationship between people and crews who are recognized more have higher customer satisfaction. How drastic are the results for this stuff? Because I know we talked, you know, we've talked several times about reinforcing the behaviors that you want, but are we seeing a noticeable uptick in behavior or is it just like, yeah, we'll get, you get 3% more in studies, like, is it, is it a hundred percent more? Like how, what's the magnitude of what we're talking about here that, that's now, possible? Yeah. It depends on the outcome metric, to be honest with you. So fortunately on our analytics team, we have data scientists and we're doing significance testing. So I will tell you that the results are significant, like from a, from a science data nerd perspective, our clients are also telling us that this is practically significant, that it makes a difference in their business. So to give you specifics, the recognition item, I've seen that increase by as much as 10 percentage points. I've seen turnover decrease by 5 to 10%. But of course, that depends on the client and where they're starting, right? Yeah. We've even had clients who have really high engagement to begin with. Like I remember one client was at 85% out of a hundred and you look at that and you go, Oh, are we going to improve that? <laughs> and we did, right? Yeah. We absolutely did. Okay. So yeah, there's another client study we have where voluntary turnover starts at like 3.4% for people who are not engaged in the program at all. But with just two peer recognition moments, that number goes down a whole percentage point and goes down to 0.4% for people who are fully immersed and engaged in different elements of the program. So it is significant to answer your question. Okay. Let's talk about measuring bias then for a second. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me a little bit more about how you see bias play out in this and then how clients have caught it and corrected it? Yes. So, you know, first of all, at a foundational level, we're looking at differences in frequency of recognition and the compensation associated with recognition. A couple of things that we have found consistently, women get more recognition events than men, but they get less compensation from a recognition program compared to men. We also tend to see that white employees get the most compensation from a recognition program. And then we see that despite or evidence that giving and receiving recognition has all these positive impacts on things like feeling connected to the culture, feeling connected to your colleagues, feeling engaged, wanting to stay with the organization. Black and Hispanic men are the least likely to give and receive recognition in an organization. What we're hearing from our clients and from at least one chief diversity officer in particular is that us presenting this data, particularly in this nuanced way, gives them an opportunity to drive a conversation and to drive awareness that makes behavior better. So it opens up a conversation and allows people to self-correct because now they know. We had one client where we discovered a bias in the types of language being used. And what they did as a result of what we presented was to drive awareness for everybody about the types of language that should be used as an example. It's interesting that Black and Hispanic men are the least likely to both give and receive feedback. That's right. Why is that or, or what have you found? Well, what we find is contagion in the best way, right? When somebody gives me recognition and I get the good feelings, <laughs> then I will want to reciprocate it. But if I've never been invited to this party, I don't mm. know how to dance at this party, right? Interesting. Like, yeah. And so it's another way to look at inclusion because we're typically doing these analytics 
for companies that have a really robust recognition program where most people are engaged in giving and receiving. And so it is an example of being left out of an experience. Well, it just goes back to what you were saying before about if you want to see another behavior, you got to reinforce it. Exactly. One interesting question on this, you hear a lot in different parts of the media or social media world over the last couple of years as we've seen a huge wave of DE&I work being done that, you know, there's a group of people who are worried that we're going the other way and that it's actually the white men or the white women are not going to be recognized in the way that they were recognized before, right? I think you probably heard those arguments. Have you seen anything like that? Like, have you seen a shift over the last two years in more recognition going to minority groups or more compensation going to minority groups? Or is it kind of the same biases are still there, even though the awareness has been there for the last two years? Yeah. So the short answer to that question is absolutely not. We have not seen that. (laughs) Session for clients who presented data to and are intentionally trying to improve in this area. This is why I'm so passionate about data and analytics, because you know, you have a narrative that is pure anecdote and then you have data, right? Yeah. What is our data saying? Not that. We are still seeing that white people, particularly white men, are the most compensated typically from a recognition program. White women are typically the most recognized in a recognition program. So no, we have not seen any changes to that okay. in general. I assumed that's what you were going to say, but I wanted to ask the question just because I could I could hear somebody voicing that in sure. their head, right? Because there is a little bit of that narrative that like, oh, well, now white guys are being left behind, right? Sure. And, and I think that's a nuanced conversation we don't need to get into, but I just wanted to wanted to ask that question. No, I'm glad you asked it so that it could be addressed, right? I think it's worse when people think something that they don't ask, that it never gets corrected or addressed or spoken yeah. about. Yeah. One other thing I want to talk to you about is compensation. Yes. So you had mentioned before, you know, you don't do stickers, you don't do that kind of thing, pins, medallions, whatever, but you do do compensation. Yeah. And I was curious your thoughts around compensation as a best practice, because I could see it cutting both ways. I could see it garnering more attention, but Mm -hmm. I could also see it as a motivation killer. Like I, as I was prepping for this, I was just thinking about what I've learned in studies about intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation and how if we reinforce intrinsic motivation, something Mm -hmm. that comes from within us, you actually create more motivation. But if you reinforce a behavior with extrinsic motivation, with money or some kind of actual tangible reward, you can increase performance or increase the behavior for a short period of time, but you're going to need more of that thing to continue to get the same level of outcome. And actually, then when you take it away, that motivation goes away. And there were some studies done, I think, with young, very young children that were rewarded for reading books. They were given money for reading books. And what they found is as they got older and the money went away, they actually read less books than their peers, even into adulthood, which is like incredibly sad and tragic to me. So all that long sort of back context of why I'm asking the question to say, how do we think about money and tying money to these programs? Yeah, I think it's an and and not an or, right? I don't think you have to appeal to intrinsic or extrinsic motivation. I think, and the science supports me in this, that in this instance, it's best to appeal to both. And so that's why the impact is part of, you know, this is what this meant to me and this is what this did for myself and those around you, right? That part is important. But what we're finding in the research is that when we add a monetary component to a recognition event, it actually has more of an impact on outcomes like engagement and turnover than if you didn't. So it adds 
a gravitas that seems to let people know, oh, wow, like you really appreciate it. Now, we don't tell people that every recognition event has to have a monetary component associated with it because we find impacts of frequency and value, right? And so you can amp up the frequency if you recognize even small behaviors that you want repeated, but maybe those don't rise to a level of needing a monetary addition to the message. But if somebody does something huge, right? Imagine if somebody did something like, (laughs) I don't know, worked on vacation as we spoke about before. If you just say a thank you, that's maybe kind of not enough. So we suggest that people use both. We also tend to see in our research that if you use non-monetary recognition too many times in a row, you actually have a negative effect on outcomes like retention. Oh, interesting. Yeah. So in in conclusion, you know, I think that compensation, I'm going to go out on a limb and come in hot and say this. I think it is the part of HR that we have innovated the least. And so I, I actually encourage people to think of their compensation budget. Like people are coming to work to earn a paycheck, right? And all we're doing with this, taking a piece of that to reinforce behaviors as they happen. It's the same compensation, right? We're just distributing it differently. And in my opinion, and according to the science, in a much more powerful way. Hmm. So how do we avoid bias then while still giving managers or leaders the ability to adjust compensation based on the severity of the thing that they're recognizing? Yeah, so I think one of the first things that help is anchoring this around values and exactly which behaviors should you be reinforcing. That's super, Mm. super helpful. Not just letting them willy-nilly reinforce whatever they want. Exactly, right? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing is, you know, just like anything else in HR that we measure when we look at representation or engagement scores, we're holding ourselves accountable to making sure it's equitable recognition is no different. And then when we find what we find, making sure that people are aware so that they can self-correct. So I don't think, you know, we're we're human beings and we're fallible. I don't think there's any avoiding bias, right? But there is a way to manage it. Mm -hmm. A couple more questions on delivering recognition. Because most of what we've been talking about, all of what we've been talking about is written recognition. Mm -hmm. Do you see a difference between the impact of written recognition versus spoken recognition? Mm -hmm. This is another one that I will answer with an and instead of an or. You know, as a data princess, (laughs) I like things written and in a system because then we can analyze the data and see what's happening. I just know from my experience that so many things happen to people in organizations that the organization is blind to. Because there's no documentation of it. There's no way to measure it. I am really passionate about things about the experience that can be measured that we can then take action on because now the organization knows. So that's the first thing. But that doesn't mean that you can't reinforce some of these things that you've written in a spoken way. So I recommend to clients, for example, as you drive towards a recognition culture, You know, maybe if you're the leader of a team and you're having team meetings, maybe every team meeting, you choose one recognition moment to amplify and to mention and to celebrate. Maybe if you're having issues getting peers to recognize each other, you choose one of those examples to celebrate, right? Now, you have to make sure, though, that when you do that, the person that is being recognized is okay with public recognition. because. That is important as well. In our research with Gallup, we find that there's a difference in preferences for whether something remains private or public. Now, my personal opinion is that when something is public on a social feed, it's different than when something is public in a team meeting, especially if the team meeting is large. So I would just say, go ahead and check that. Which one of those is better or worse, the social feed or the group meeting? I think the social feed is easier for people even if they don't like that public recognition, 
because it's not like everybody in a thousand person auditorium is turning around and looking at you when your name is called. A lot of us are used to social feeds from Instagram and Facebook. And so I kind of feel like it is a great way to get the benefits of public recognition because we do find an impact of the social feed and an impact of your colleagues commenting and amplifying a recognition moment. We call that the witnessing effect. And we find that amplifies feelings of connection to colleagues and culture and decreases burnout and stress, all kinds of good things. But I feel like it's more palatable than the whole, I'm in an auditorium and everybody's going to turn around and look at me. What do you see in the research from people who say that they don't like public recognition? Like, do they actually have adverse effects when they get publicly recognized? Because I could see somebody being uncomfortable in the moment to get that recognition, but it still feels good to be recognized. And to your point, there's like community building and all kinds of like mental health stuff that go on when somebody gets recognized in front of their peers. So is it really, are we really doing that person a disservice if we're giving them a recognition in public? I mean, I get if we're like pulling them on stage and making them give a speech and like really putting them on the spot, that could be pretty negative. Mm -hmm. But if we're just giving somebody recognition and appreciation in a group setting and reinforcing that behavior to the group, Is it really that bad? You know, I wouldn't say this is something that we've studied super, super extensively, but I would say that it can lead to a feeling of, you don't really know me, you know? Like if you're doing this and I'm really like socially uncomfortable with attention and you do it anyway, it can lead to the feeling that the people I work with really either don't know me or aren't sensitive to how I feel, which is a bad thing. I will tell you this, when we look at the percentage of people who say they prefer private versus public recognition in our research with Gallup and we ask it more generally, and then we look at our system and see how many people have indicated that they never want their stuff to show up on a social feed, the numbers are very different, right? Which makes me feel like that part, like that social feed is more palatable even to people who don't prefer to have the big splash. Yeah, I could see a scenario. Again, this goes back to the complexity of being a leader and knowing your people. But I could see a scenario where you want to reinforce that behavior with the group. Mm -hmm. And so doing kind of the just some basic recognition of it in front of the group makes sense. But then pulling that person aside and saying, hey, I hope I didn't embarrass you there. I really am appreciative. And I also think you're a great example for everybody else. And so that's why I did that, even knowing you might be a little bit uncomfortable. Hope that's okay. I would tweet that and do that before and not after. Mm, You know, because you do it before and you go, hey, you know, I know this might make you uncomfortable, but I just wanted to check in with you. Is it okay? I think it would be really important for your colleagues to hear. And that way it's like... They're part of it. Yes. And the person has the opportunity to say, hey, absolutely not. I'm still not comfortable. Or they can, they have the opportunity to go, you know what? Thank you for actually, you, you've you really hit me. Thank yeah. you for checking in with me. You know, it is uncomfortable, but you know, I'll allow it. <laughs> you go. See, I'm, I'm learning all kinds of things today. This is fantastic. I wanted to ask you, we're talking about group settings. I wanted to ask you too about the difference between giving somebody feedback one-on-one versus in a group. Do you find there are people who don't want to be recognized in a group? I get that. But do you find like more like kind of like wholesale population wise, one-on-one has more of an impact on somebody versus in a group setting? Or does a group setting have more of an impact than one-on-one because they get some status boost in front of their peers? Yeah. So I would say, you know, there are two different types of feedback, the positive and the constructive. For positive, yes, the group setting really amplifies the one-on-one recognition moment because it allows other people to chime in, says like, this is really a big deal. You know, there's the celebration aspect. So it's, it's another and, not an or, right? But then for the constructive criticism, I hope this is obvious to people listening, but that should be one-on-one. 
you do not want to do that kind of feedback in a group setting. Fair enough. And that is a good distinction for sure. So we've talked about a lot here today so far, and there is very likely somebody still listening to this who's going, holy cow, this is so much to get my arms around. Like, I just want my people to feel good about the work they do. And like all this tracking and all making sure we're not biased and managing compensation and like this, I don't, I barely have the bandwidth to do my job, let alone do something like this. What do you say to that person to maybe walk them back off the ledge? I would say, come to the experts. You don't have to worry about it. We'll do it for you. We'll do it for you. And we'll consult our way through it, right? We'll we'll take on big chunks of it. Like the analysis, our team does that. We don't, we don't ask our clients to do that. Our team does that. We even consult on, you know, change management and program relaunches. And so this is the important importance of having an expert hold your hand. And then on the other side, what you get for all of that is increased things like engagement, retention, business outcomes that we can prove. So we will help make HR a hero to the business is what you get for that. Okay. And I didn't want to ask it that specifically, but I I was curious if the reporting and consulting piece was part of kind of the core of what you do. Because I could see somebody going like, I just, I don't have the bandwidth or the expertise to do this and needing somebody to go like, hey, great, you've been running this program. Now here's what you need to know about the program. And here's some course corrections that we'd recommend. So that is, that's part of what you guys do. That's absolutely part of what we do. And I I love that because I feel like I've worked, I've been on the customer side and worked with other models where every little thing you need, you have to pay extra for. And so you don't get everything that you need because you can't afford it. We are not that model. And so as somebody now on the work human side, it means I get to do a lot of cool stuff. Yeah. We sell against those models all the time. (laughs) Some people are like, I just don't want to pay for another benchmarking exercise. It's like, well, you don't have to. We are in agreement there. One question I wanted to ask you before we get to the end of this, Mm -hmm. we had talked about these being life skills, not just work skills, and how recognition can be used in every relationship that you have. And you had made the comment that you have seen this skill set of improving your ability to recognize others have a dramatic impact in your own personal life. And I would love it if you would be willing to share, you don't have to, but if you'd be willing to share some examples of how you have made changes in how you share recognition in your personal life that you've seen have an impact? Yeah. So as I said before, I've been really intentional with my people about, hey, here's what I appreciate about you in general. When you did that specific thing, here's what it meant for me. And here's, it's interesting because I'm a psychologist. And so I I know the importance of vulnerability, but it's something that I had to practice. And as I started to talk to people in my personal life about why something meant so much to me, it actually gave me practice talking about my feelings, which is weird to say, but it has been really transformational and opened up different layers of all the relationships in my life. I also feel like it has shown people how to treat me. Because what I realized I was doing before is somebody would do something for me that I appreciated, but I never would say it. And then I would wonder, well, why didn't they do that again? It's because I never told them that I liked it, right? And so I just feel like I have better relationships. I'm treated better. People know what it is I like and how to treat me and the types of conversations I'm able to have with people I love have definitely improved as a result. That's great. Thank you for that. And I think I would, I mean, we'll see what the data says on this, but I would argue that guys are worse at this. (laughs) Stick in another stereotype I have, but I would argue that guys are worse at this. And I've noticed in my own life, being willing to tell another guy as a guy 
mm-hmm. the appreciation I have for them has totally transformed relationships and yeah. like opened them up in a really mean, and you can have much more meaningful relationships that way. And I think guys are often scared to do that, which is why I've seen a lot of relationships sort of like stay at the surface level. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like that whole love you, bro, can be really hard as a start. But if you start out with, hey, you did so-and-so, good looking out. Like it's a it's a successive approximation to that whole love you, bro. You know? So you're so- saying we can keep the bro language. We can just add in a little bit more explanation around why we felt a certain way. That is absolutely correct. All right. That, that's funny. <laughs> Anything else we've not covered before we wrap up here when it comes to recognition? We've gone pretty deep down the well here, but a- anything that people bring up or any mistakes that people make that you want to just talk to before we get off the subject? Yeah, I would say one of the mistakes that I see people make is thinking that this should be a manager-driven thing. It's only something for managers to do with their direct report. That is not accurate. There's so many behaviors that a manager doesn't see. This is a relationship enhancer. Even though the relationship between manager and direct report is important, the relationship between peers is also important as well. Also, there is a beauty to getting everybody to be a talent spotter, right? And a behavior spotter and hold people mutually accountable to the behaviors that the organization intends to see or wants to see. And so if you're only having managers do it to, you know, for their direct reports, you are totally under leveraging the power that is recognition. Well, and even beyond that, because that's a great point. And even beyond that, you don't need a formal recognition program to give recognition in the workplace, right? Be the change you want to see in the world. If you are somebody, whether you're a frontline employee or you are a mid-level manager or you're an executive, if you want to see change in your organization, you can start to be that change and change happens one person at a time. So all the principles that we've talked about here today apply outside of any formal program. That is correct. It starts with the human connection and with the relationship and how you interact with people around you at work and outside of work. Misha, and the last question that I usually ask guests, and I warned you about this one, is what is the purpose of business? And I am curious on your take coming from a company called Work Human and doing so much work in recognition and having a psychology degree. What is the purpose of business in your mind? So now you're really going to see what kind of person I am because I think the purpose of business is to improve the world for the people in the world. And I know that that's a hot take, right? But if every business thought about their offerings in the sense of how does this improve lives instead of how does this make money, the world would be a much better place and the money would come. Yeah. I love that. Thank you, Misha Ann, for coming on the show. Thank you for dispelling so many myths and rumors around uh, employee recognition programs. I think this is really interesting. It's not a topic that I've covered on here before, and it's always exciting to dive into new stuff on here. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun. And good luck, everybody out there. I hope you will take this to heart. And even just if it's in your personal life, you know, share a little bit of gratitude and recognition today. Hey folks, one last thing before you go. If you enjoyed the episode, make sure to hit subscribe so you can stay up to date with future guests. That's it. Thanks for coming. Go make the most of your business and the people in it.